are away from her and the entire leadership of the house. And uh, I can see many familiar faces, so I'm very comfortable in the house. I'm at home with many people. The reality is, it takes a lot for women to find their voice. And it takes a lot for women of understanding to find their place. But it takes even more for women to understand that every promise in the word of God belongs to them. That they are not deceived by the culture of men, the voices of men, the rules of men, and the rules of society outside of the word of God. That as women, you will come to an understanding of the fact that you are first and foremost the child of God. And that's why the Bible says sons, it means it's appointed, anointed, covenant children. And that the son in the Bible is gender neutral. That it has nothing to do with whether you can give birth to a child or not. That all it has to do is with the fact that you understand that you are a benefactor of the covenant that is embedded in the crucifixion of Christ upon the cross. That that blood that was shed and the body that was broken of Christ brought you into a covenant that can never be received. And that you have the rights and the privilege as anybody else, no matter your gender. And that God is a keeper of his word. And that in keeping his word, he meant that every promise and purpose is fulfilled. Have you laid examples through time? There are women who are judges in the Bible. Deborah was a judge in the Old Testament. In the time when it seemed like women could not speak. There were women that were kings even in old times. You know, my Muslim name is Belkisu, but it's the name of the Queen of Sheba. So that tells you, as far back as Solomon's time, there were women in rulership. So that you can understand the environment and not be conditioned. Because the challenge is, in trying to live in the context of our society, we allow ourselves to be conditioned. And any conditioning outside of the world is a lie. Anything that does not comply with the word of God, the will of God, or the purpose of God is a lie. There were men in Bible times when the Lord chose to use the Shunammite woman as the vehicle of blessing for the prophet. That means that from generations to generations, God has proposed that women can be used as tools and vehicles of greatness and of blessings. And it's not about whether you're a righteous woman, you've been there, no. Mary Magdalene was a prostitute. She had lived a life of mistake and error. She had lived in sin. But at the time that she came to herself, and remembered the errors of her ways. She sought the Lord herself. And without sense of shame or condemnation, she went to the feet of the Lord and sought redemption in worship. Till tomorrow, you and I know the name of Mary Magdalene. And she served the Lord till his last days and thereafter. And there are many great women who lived in the time who were not aligned with the purpose of God that we do not know who they are, nor any mention of them or their generations. So hear me as I hear God. Your commitment to your life is to commit to God and his assignment and calling for your life. And everything else can jump in the lake. That your biggest assignment is that you will live your life according to that which the Lord has called you to. 
And you will live that life to create value for the kingdom of God and the things of God. And your life will have meaning. Because God is not in the habit of wasting resources. He didn't pay attention to create the phenomenal you. To pay attention to design. If I tell every single one of you to stand up, each one of you is different. There's, what do they call them? Identical twins? Look closely, you'll find the difference. I have very close friends who are identical twins. And every time you say, I can't tell them about like why. I can't. But this is Tyro, this is Kendi. They're different. They look so similar, but look closely. Why are we so different? Why is our DNA specific? Why is our fingerprint specific? What does that tell you? God designed each man. Each son he paid attention to create you. That's why the Bible says we're fearfully and wonderfully made. You are special in the hands of God. It doesn't matter what your season is. There are seasons in our lives, and each season serves a purpose. Lack of understanding of the ways of God allows you, no, makes you allow one season to consume the purpose of God in your life. So our sister, when the trucks were stuck in Borno, and they have a wonderful governor, by the way, very decent. She could have decided that it's the email you. How am I ever going to pay all these truck owners? How am I ever going to get out of this? And like her sister said, it's the kind of time you get the voice of the enemy telling you, you better run or kill yourself because there's no way you're ever going to pay this. It's finished for you. One season in the midst of multiples of seasons. How? God ordained our lives in seasons. And each season has a purpose. Hers could have been to bring her children to a knowing knowledge of God in a way that she could never have been able to do in the midst of plenty. Hers could have been to learn what it is to be helpless. Because men have no answer. Yes. And you have to get to a point where you lean on God and God alone. Hers could have been that she got to a point where she had to make a choice between God and man. Even for the benefits of the world. She chose Christ because she chose righteousness. She chose to live. Because that place did not honor God or align with her values. We all make those choices every day in different ways. So pay attention. Be sure that every time you have been faced with a choice, you haven't chosen anything else other than your God. Because at the end of the day, for every situation that we're faced with in any season, when we make a choice, we're only choosing between two things. We're choosing God or not. You're standing with God or against Him. You will get first class if you sleep with the lecturer. Who will see? Who will know? But if you do that, you chose a useless degree over the God of the universe. Because who will prosper you with a degree? Get a promotion or sleep with a boss. Okay? You need life to occupy the office of the promotion. Who wants your life? You will earn more money from that. And you have to have life to spend it. You have to be in good health to enjoy it. I know many people who would wish that the money they have could buy their life, but you can't. Because it's not for sale. It's a gift of God. 
reality is. The life that you live is not yours. It belongs to God. He has signed you to the earth for a season within that season of life that he has assigned you to. There are many seasons. And that's why when people ask a lot of questions about, I don't know my purpose, I don't know my purpose, leave the time and the moment that you have. Leave it righteously and leave it well. Leave it with a sense of consciousness of God. Apply yourself to the best that you can in that season and that moment. And whatever the opportunity is, small or big, Whatever your hand finds to do, do it well. Honor God with it. And let's see if he will show himself in that place. You know one thing I've learned from my life? There are multiple purposes for different seasons. That's true. I have lived many lives in one life, and I'm not done. So the reality is, God has a master plan for your life. But it's a journey of adventure. And there's a master who controls the script and controls the plan. How do you go on an adventure? It's a matter of trust. Do you trust God? Do you trust him enough to follow him even though you do not fully understand or comprehend what is ahead of you? Yeah. You know what was waiting for you? When she got the job, if anybody told her, don't take that job, the job there, she said, ah, I find you, sit <laughs> Why? Looks like a good transaction. That job looks like a good job. CFO, international company, good offer, good pay, nice new car. We're all blind people following Christ, if we follow. Why? Because the only one who knows tomorrow and who sees tomorrow is God. And our responsibility is to position ourselves to be so aligned with God that we can walk with Him day by day, hour by hour. That we will seek the presence of God in our lives, in all that we do, in all that we think, that we will seek His guidance. The Bible says, they that know their God, they shall be strong and they will do exploits. Knowing God means understanding Him, understanding His ways, understanding His thinking, His mind, understanding His desires, His plan. The Bible calls Abraham God's word, God's friend. You can see it in the life of Abraham. Why? Because he and God were aligned. They were in tune. Even when it didn't make sense, he knew what God wanted in the situation that he followed. Even when it was painful, he made the choice. When he missed it, he didn't sit on it. His flesh went to the mate. He produced Ishmael. But when God told him what the covenant is, that he would listen to the voice of Sarah. He didn't think twice about putting out the maid and her child. Why? He knew his salvation was in the form But you have to hear him. You have to understand him. You have to perceive him. You have to trust him enough to cast everything else aside, including an Ishmael and her mother, considering he didn't have another child yet. Don't forget, it was not that Isaac had come. Isaac was only a promise. Isaac was not reality. But then God told him, the one you can see, cast out. Because the one I have spoken about will come. What did that take? Trust. For you and I to live our lives successfully. We can only trust God. Now, let me tell you. In trusting God in this journey, because the ways of God are like foolishness unto men, there are many times people will think you are insane. Because it's not all the time that you 
choose God, that it will be obvious to men that you are doing the right thing. Even you will question yourself. But, like Abraham, if you know that God is God and He is your God, and you don't have a plan B, because I don't, have you got into the place where you have told yourself, I don't have a plan B in my life. I have nothing else I'm trusting on. I have nothing else I'm resting on. I have nothing else that I'm holding on to. Not man, not woman, not powers, not principalities, nothing but God. And am I confident that that God will come through? The Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews that there were those who believed God. They were called as leaders of faith. They didn't even receive what they believed God for. But they were recorded as great men of faith. Why? Because in heaven, they got the reward of the faith as if they received it. The three Hebrew children were ready to burn in a consuming fire. And they didn't care whether God delivered them or not. What did they care about? That they were obeying God. I know you're celebrating, but I want you to know what sets you apart from the crowd. What sets you apart from the crowd doesn't necessarily make you popular. Just understand that. But when you get the victory of being set apart by your God, and the power of that God manifests in your life for the whole world to see, that no one can argue that this is your God. When the Lord will turn around the captivity of Zion, we shall be like them that dream dreams. Because even you, though you are the believer, you are human. And though you are the believer, you're holding onto the helm of his garment. But yet your heart is human. And sometimes it's afraid. But then you remind yourself of who your God is. And then you surround yourself with Aaron's and all's. With men and women who fear God, who believe with you in God, who can hold your hand through like they did for her. So that she didn't give up on it when it didn't make sense anymore. Because you know when things don't make sense anymore, you start looking for options. Yes. Option A, option B, option C, option D. They don't necessarily fit in with God. My sisters, we live a life of choices. You get to choose every day. You choose which one you want. But you know, God is such a merciful Father. He said, I lay before you one life and death. But because he's such a kind God, he gave you the answer. He didn't wait for you to think about it because he does not want you to make a mistake. That's the love of a father. The love of a father that said, Whoa, I know the question sounds easy, but this is the answer. This is the question. I want to be sure you get a 100%. No mistake. And so he said, I lay before you life and death. But by chance, you think there is anything in this glowing golden death as represented by the options of the world. You know, life and death seems simple. Everybody is likely to choose life. But that's not what God is talking about. Because there is so much that looks alive, that looks glittery, but that inside it is death. There is so much that we can be deceived by because the world offers you a lot of garbage, a lot of death wrapped in gold. That job looked good. The pay was good. The pecs were good. But in 
inside the job was corruption and compromise and betrayal of her faith and her values as a child of God. And she got to a crossroad where she had to make a choice. I remember one of my nephews, his wife, that worked in one of the global consulting firms. And she got to work in a smaller emerging company because sometimes it looks like a good opportunity and it can't be. But it didn't work out, so she left. So she'd been out of work for a while. And she was trying to do business and all of that, but we're all caught up for different things. And then she got this job, the pay and everything was good. And she was excited about getting back to work again. So I saw her one day in my auntie's house, and I said, so how far? She said, no, I have this job. And I said, hey, what did they do there? When she told me, I said, you are not taking that job. And she said, no, auntie, how, you know how long I've been I said, no, I promise you, you don't want to take that job. But you know, sometimes you let people learn. So I told her my opinion, and I left. And then another time, it was my uncle's birthday. And I went by my house, and she was there. And she married to my son. And I said, how is the job going? She looked down. I said, now, you know what She said, I have decided just like you. I said, hey, what happened? She said, ah, plenty. Everything looked good. When I got in, and I saw what it entailed. I remembered what you said. And then I realized that, ah, I'm about to destroy everything I built in my career. And they thought, ah, it's nothing now. We we'll pay you well, we'll give you commission, we'll do this. But everything was wrong with what she had to do on the job. She said she lasted one week. No, she said by the end of that one week, she knew that. If I stay on that here, my name will be destroyed with her. And she left. I smiled. I said to her, I know how it feels, but sometimes, waiting a little longer, based on what you know is right and your values, is the right thing. That's what her testimony. I was sitting down there excited as I listened to the testimony, because I knew my son was rich. And this is when, how you know, when God has sent you on an errand and he's told you things, I just, I don't laugh it to myself. Because in reality, every single one of you can come here every day and have amazing testimonies at different times because your seasons are all different. So don't look at sister A, sister B, sister C and say, ah, child what you call it, ah. That is the problem of my own life. Child what you call it. Mm -hmm. No, it's true. I, I don't apologize to anybody. This is the reality. You live the life you have been given. You live the life you have been given without apologies. Because I serve no one but Jehovah. And the assignment of my, of my life is to live that life in a way that it brings people to the kingdom and lift the name of Jehovah. And we all have different assignments. Your responsibility is to live yours in fullness without fear of men. They that know they are God. That strong that the Bible says sounds to you like a simple word, but it has different interpretations in different situations to different people. You will be strong because you will stand. You will be strong because you will fight. You will be strong because you will be courageous. You will be strong because you will be unyielding. You will be strong because you will not compromise. You will be strong because you will not bow to them. You will be strong because you will not walk against the will and the word of God. You will be strong because you will bear pain and hunger just to fulfill the word of God. You will be strong as you will reach out to the hungry and the needy in the name of the Lord. You will be strong in prayers for another. You will be strong in your service. You will be strong in your pain in the place of work just because you are standing for God. 
could be strong to face the enemy on their top. Why? The Bible says you are more than conquerors. And it says they that know their God that are strong will do what? Exploits. No, will do exploits. You do great exploits. How do you do exploits? What happens before it can be declared that you've done exploits? War. But so you want to be strong and do exploits, you must be ready for war. You must be ready to fight. You must be ready to go for war in the name of the Lord. Will the world always understand you? Who cares? Do you understand the assignment of God in your life? Do you know enough to know what to ask God? Because to leave it, you need the wisdom of God. It is the wisdom of God that leads you through the pathways and teaches you how you take charge and control of the path that you walk so that you can have victory. You only play to win in Christ. Men can play to win and think they have won temporarily. Except the Lord builds a house. Except the men, or except God watches over a city. The men stay awake for nothing. So what do I want you to know? I want your heart to be encouraged. I want you to be fearless. Because the Bible says the children of God are what? As bold as a lion. What does that mean? A lion is fearless. You know what people say, oh, we're to let you jump. Mm. You are the children of the lion of the tribe of Judah. It takes courage to step out out of a job into a new job. But to do it in faith and for righteousness. It takes courage and faith to try something new that doesn't make sense to others and yet your breakthrough is in it. That's how we're going is the story. Because some would have put that time but ah ah. Boy, boy. Are you thinking? You know, my best friend is here on this side. And as someone, she's a lawyer and a banker, went to Unilag, they went to Cambridge, as company secretary for Eco Bank for 13 and a half years. Moved from there into private banking, West Africa, whatever she was. She had a golden handcuff job. Cushiony and nice. But she had a thirst and a desire to do more. And her heart was drawn to event management that didn't really exist. And I remember someone saying to her, are you all right? Open the matter of a balloon. As in, we want to be tying balloon for people's party, setting up food and all of our events. For what? You that you went to Cambridge? Her first office in her husband's factory, you gave her one book. She put all her certificates on the wall just to remind herself that okay, I did earn this certificate. <laughs> That's true. She made sure she had a Nice table, a nice yellow chair, you know, try to make it look as nice as possible. And all those certificates were on the side. She said, so every time I look to my right, I can see, okay, he went to school, it's okay. But it was a step of faith. Thirteen years out, she exited and left the biggest events management company that other people are taking for, and she only sits as chair of it. And all the things she's been able to do in between. Only an act of faith. A step of faith. Daring to believe God that what no one can see. What does the Bible call faith? Believing those things that are not as if what? As if they are. That's what faith is. It's nothing you know. What you're believing for is not something you've walked through before. You want to do exploits? You have to 
be able to believe God for what you cannot see. But you can only see in your mind's eye. And long, while this clock is ticking, some sign out. Because somebody dies. And the clock stops for them, not for you. So on account of nobody's death, should you lose time? I know that sounds cold and cut, but I'm not joking. The Bible says we should mourn with those who mourn. We should celebrate with those who celebrate. But I never told you to stop walking your purpose. The clock is still ticking. Look at that situation of that person and see what learnings are there that will enhance your journey. Because you are still going to account for this time that is ticking. You're not off the bus. And every minute of your life was assigned for something. So, don't allow others to steal your time by calling you to nonsensical things that had no value to the assignment of your life or the purpose of God. We get caught in, I don't know, junk things. Some people think I'm too serious. I know how to enjoy life, trust me. I know how to have a holiday, and when I'm on holidays, I'm truly on holidays. Those who are close to me know. I assign time for things. I the mother where I should be. And my children know. If it's not their time, when I'm doing something else I'm supposed to be doing, everybody gets out of my way. Why? This time is ticking. It's counting down. I don't know when my clock is supposed to stop. Neither do you. But I am responsible for every minute of it. And I will account to God for it. So I'm not about to allow anybody to steal my time or to stop my time from working. I remember the day we had the first bank crisis. The next day, I had a board meeting and I connected. And somebody, hey, you're in a meeting. I'm like, because somebody decides to dance the dance of something. Does that stop my life? I know who I am. I know what my assignment is. I know the work I did. I know the work I'm yet to do. I know the work I will yet to do. And I know I will finish work. So I wasn't stopping for no one or anything. When your time is up, ask them. Do you not wonder? Your birth certificates have time of birth to the last second. Your death certificate, if you've seen one before, if your parents have been dead, has the time of death to the last second. Why? Because all you and I have been assigned is time. The day you understand that your life is time, you will treat time differently. You will apply your time to wisdom and to value. And you will do things that are productive for God, for humanity, and for your assignment. Oh, there are times of rest. I just got back from a holiday. I have a holiday scheduled in my calendar for the year. When my kids were even still at school in England, beginning of the year, as they go back to school, me and my husband cut ourselves and go somewhere. That's husband time. Serious energy that I will gain and I will spend. Total attention, 10 days, 12 days, 14 days. Come back. If we come back and the next day I need to go to the meeting, what do you think will happen? I will go without any question. So you work your time to productively work for you. But don't forget, you're on the clock. Make sure it works for you. May the Lord bless you. May He keep you. May He guide you. May He lead you in the way to go. 
May the Lord grant you wisdom for the assignment of your life. When you wake up every morning, may you wake up with the consciousness of the presence of God in your life. When the Lord speaks to you, may you hear him and hear his voice clear. When the Lord leads you in the way to go, may you have the grace to submit to that instruction and walk in that way. May the Lord grant you the courage to face up every challenge of the world. May you have the courage to say no when you should. And the courage to say yes when you should. May your time count. May every minute of your time, may it count and count for Christ. At the end of your day, may it be said, but see this handmaiden of the Lord, for she has lived and lived for her past. And she dies empty with nothing left that she could have done, but she did not do. My biggest dream is to die empty. And that's why I wait for no one. The day I die, I hope to God there's not one more talent, one more opportunity. One more sermon I could have preached. One more office I could have occupied. One more platform I could have used for the purpose of God. One more life I could have impacted. One more thing I could have built. Or one more wall I could have pulled out that I have been assigned to that I have not. But as I pray for myself, I pray the same for you. Amen. And all you will need, you will never lack. Amen. All the helpers of your life, wherever they are, the Lord will draw them unto you Amen. and they will not rest Amen. until they find you. Amen. Because in your miracle is the fulfillment of the purpose of God. Amen. And God will finish his purpose. Amen. Thank you, Father. Thank For in Jesus' name I pray. Raise up your hand. How about you jump up and pray? 